Uh, let's look at the syllabus. Well, I mean, the syllabus is your normal, normal syllabus, except uh, we will not have quizzes in here. We're replacing all of them with extra writing. <laughs> so, <laughs> quizzes are replaced with extra writing. Um, let's see. So homework assignments, which are going to come in the form of, and I'll talk about these more in a few minutes, um, uh, idea papers, annotated bibliographies, and um, uh, let's call them short research papers. Those are going to be the, the, the form of all of our assignments. Okay, And uh, the course is going to go in two-week cycles. So the first week we're going to be dealing, or the first two weeks, we'll be dealing with one of the grand ideas of computer science, which we'll talk about today. So next week, what you'll submit is an idea paper, as well as a annotated bibliography for the topic you're going to write your paper that's due in two weeks um, about. And we'll talk about what those things are and things like that here in a few minutes. But uh, um, and then in two weeks, you'll have through the next week a idea paper and an annotated bibliography for the next grand idea of computer science that you're going to be dealing with a topic on. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Something along those lines. Uh, and, and I think it will be. We were kind of debating it over uh, um, uh, text, and I was explaining kind of the experience we had at the end of uh, 548, where, you know, you had a lot to do, right, at, you know, with a lot of paper stuff at once, and, you know, I thought smaller but more might make more sense. So we're going with that. Uh, then there will be a uh, midterm and a final, and the midterm and the final are going to... Um, they're going to be kind of interesting as well. So there might be a couple of things we do talk about in class lecture-wise, but the class isn't going to be too much lecture because we're going to be doing a lot of presenting in class. But what the midterm and final will be is it's going to be almost evidence of being able to read research papers, which you're going to get plenty of practice doing as you're creating these annotated bibliographies. So just to kind of go off on a tangent along the lines of those right now, um, well, has anybody in here ever written an annotated bibliography? All right. So what what is it? Tell me about it. Basically, you give the source and then kind of summarize or give what you would use from it. Okay. What's the purpose of it? Isn't it so that you kind of read parts of it so that you kind of get the idea of how you're going to use it into your paper or relate it to your topic? Okay. Good. There's a vast amount of information out there, and as you go through and read through and try to find things that you use you build an annotated bibliography so when you finally come to a concrete this is what I'm writing my paper on you can go back through all your through your annotated bibliography and quickly find the things that you actually need. Yeah so it's like the idea is in a big research project you might read let's say 20 or 30 papers okay our, annota our annotated bibliographies are going to be a minimum of five papers so I'm assuming most of you are going to do five papers <laughs> all right so um the idea is you'll read five papers, and each of those papers you then summarize. You know, a couple of paragraphs or something like that that gives you your, your version of what that paper was about. Now, you know that the real meat of the paper is still found in the paper. But the annotated bibliography is going to give you enough information to go and find that paper again. You know, where was it published, blah, blah, blah. Maybe even put in a web link where you found it. Um, but you'll be able to quickly, in, a, in one or two paragraphs, read what that paper was about later on, presumably after you've already read it. Um, so the, the idea here would be, and this is kind of where the midterm and finals come in, um, some of you might be uh, um, tempted to create annotated bibliographies uh, by skimming a paper <laughs> and writing little uh, summaries of it, or even just copying the abstract <laughs> of said paper. Like, this is what this guy's about. It's, it's right there. Um, the reality is you need, you're going to need to be able to read information and distill information from the researchy way of writing papers. Um, I don't necessarily agree with the way people write papers, but as you started looking at them last semester, you'll see that um, people purposely use large words or hard to understand phrases, things like that. Um, so you're, you're going to want to get practice at reading those things and kind of distilling meaning from them. So the midterm and, a, and the final will each be, I will give you um, uh, uh, two to three pa papers, depending on 
how long the papers are and stuff like that ahead of time. You'll have time to read them and stuff like that. You can take notes on them, whatever. Um, and then the exam will be to tell me about things that were in that paper, uh, about their findings, things like that. So if you were familiar with the work, and you'll, you can still have the paper in front of you. It's not, I'm not asking you to memorize the paper. Um, but the questions will be detailed enough that you're not going to want to read that paper multiple times while you're taking the test. All right, so the idea is you familiarize yourself with the work, the two or three works. Then you have, let's say, maybe five questions. And you answer those questions in terms of your understanding of those works. Make sense? So that's like the flip side of it, showing that you understand how to read a research paper and actually get knowledge out of it. Okay, so the exams will be like that. Um, so most of your grade will be the uh, homework assignments and then 20% midterm and final. Questions about that? Okay, um, so let's go back to this for right now. So I want to talk for a little bit, and we're actually going to take a, uh, um, a break in just a few minutes because I want each of you to, to give me your version of these. Um, but Dr. Locklear focuses on this idea of the grand ideas of computer science. Okay. Now, when I say grand ideas of computer science, what, what does that kind of mean to you? What, if you had to like just summarize what that means, what would you say? We'll talk about each individual one here. But why do we need to have the grand ideas of computer science? What's the point? It gives us reason for what we do. Okay, it gives us reason. I don't know. All those give us the reason for why we do what we do. Or what? Why we need CS in general. If computer science was an egg and we cracked it, we would find examples of these things spill out. Okay, so any problem that we find in computer science to varying degrees is going to include these grand ideas. Make sense? So if anything, this is a, a way of us um, articulating what computer science is. You can come up with a similar type of approach in almost any science, or really almost anything. We're going to talk about the scientific method today. Um, there's a book here that I mentioned. I have it in the downloads, and it's on. Well, actually, I have it on the website here, too. So we have this website here called Theory of uh, this uh, link. It's to a PDF called Theory of Science, and we're going to work through this a little bit today. Um, and this is perfectly legal. It's redistributable, so you know, you tell your friends or whatever. Um, so you look through this, and this kind of gives us this idea of what the scientific method is compared to a historical way of doing things so you kind of have a foundation. So we'll start working through um, the first chapter of this today. It's not going to play a major role in what we're going to do in this course, but it gives us kind of an introduction to kind of get the ball, uh, the ball rolling. Zoom that uh, a little bit. So it kind of gives you a, you know, a visual of the scientific method, um, what the approach is and how that compares and, and that kind of stuff. All right, so we'll swing back on this here in a little bit. So these are the big ideas. If we had to distill computer science down to a handful, or in this case, you know, nine, nine key concepts, we might choose these nine key concepts. Now you can make arguments and say, okay, well, why, doesn't, why isn't this word there and this other word there? Um, this is our best way or an approach at concisely defining computer science. All right, so now the next question is, what do each of these mean? Okay, so when I say algorithms, let's create a slide for each of these. What are algorithms? Detailed set of instructions. Detailed set of instructions. Sounds clickier. Yeah, it's a different uh, kind of keyboard. Yeah, I can't decide if I love it or hate it. It's definitely not in the middle. I definitely don't just sort of like it. It's either the best keyboard I've ever used or I can't stand it. And I'm not sure which the answer is. I know. All right. So what does this mean? 
how how do, how are algorithms part of the grand idea of, of computer science? Why do we need them in computer science? What's the point? What's the whole point of computer science? Ah, well, automation's coming up here in a little bit, right? All right, so uh, tell a computer what to do. Or Dr. Locklear starts off with this idea of computer science as problem solving, right? All right, so we're solving problems. We happen to be using this dude sitting in front of us. Oh, I like the, so we have three Mac. Is that a Mac? That's not a Mac. So we have uh, uh, four Mac, well, three and a half Mac users, and then three others. You really got it as half old, Alex. Why? Why not? <laughs> you have any you have any USB C ports on that? No. I don't know. That's a dinosaur over there. That's an old. Oh, that is an old one. That still has a, dr a DVD drive in it. Um, yeah. See, at least you know she's cool. She's going retro. <laughs> You just threw stickers on yours to make it look legit or something. And he's got an air. That's an air, right? Or is that a 13 inch pro? pro? So, what do we need algorithms for? What's the point of? I mean, you specifically said it's a detailed set of instructions. What do we need that for? For if computer science is problem solving, specifically involving us telling a computer what to do, why do our instructions need to be detailed? Because computers are dumb and we don't assume anything. Okay. Uh, so we go way, way back when I first introduced computer programming in our undergrad classes. You know, I'll say something along the lines of that. Uh, you know, the reason why computer programming, for example, is difficult for human beings is because we're such good problem solvers that we've forgotten how to articulate how we solve problems, right? We usually use walking as the example. You know, all of us can, you know, we walked to class today. You know, some of you probably were texting while you were walking. You didn't bump into anybody. You didn't fall over. It wasn't even worth your full attention. Yet if I asked you to describe, to give me an algorithm for walking or a recipe for walking, we would find that extremely difficult, probably impossible, for a human being to fully articulate the algorithm for walking, right? We don't know the names of all those muscles you know, that, that are involved in walking. You know, like, well, how did you uh, not fall over? Well, I just didn't, okay? And that's what we do. Now, we can, we can recognize as human problem solvers that, yeah, there's more than meets the eye there with walking. It's not quite as easy as we make it look. But at the end of the day, we realize there's a level of abstraction there, which we'll talk about uh, soon, um, that is really unknown to us, right? We don't control the little contractions of all those muscles and things like that. At some point, it just sort of happened. You know, we were babies, we stood up, we fell over, we stood up again, we fell over, and we finally figured out how to not fall over. Then we decided, then we figured out how to do that while in motion, <laughs> right? And it was all kind of just practiced. It's like practiced mayhem. Um, so walking, I once heard it described as the, um, the act of not falling in motion or something like that. Um, so specifically, we need to talk about algorithms as being detailed instructions, a recipe, unambiguous set of instructions, uh, because that's what we need when we're dealing with computers. We have to fully articulate the solution to a problem. Now, because we have to be able to fully articulate in full detail, in an unambiguous manner, the solution to a problem in computer science, what does that mean about the types of problems we can solve in computer science? What does that imply? If we as human beings need to be able to fully articulate the solution to any problem we intend to solve. Well, the human has to be able to see it. Okay. Yeah. Which which implies what? Knowledge. Intelligence. Um, so let's go. I was trying to make a connection with the walking thing. When I said it's probably impossible for us to articulate how to walk, right? I mean, that's a, we can agree that even though to us it comes a second nature, walking is a highly complex thing. So would we all agree that 
you know, minus that, you know, argument about, well, is that you think really impossible? Minus that argument, would it be as close to impossible as it could be for us to articulate how we walk? That's too complex of a problem for us to fully articulate as a person. So this would imply that we are limited to what kind of problems we can solve with computers. You know, we're, we're limited by the human being. We can only solve problems that we can fully articulate the solution. Make sense? I always uh, think about that when you, you run into somebody and, you know, they ask you, oh, what do you do? Um, you know, I say, oh, I'm a computer science professor. I'm a programmer or something like that. And um, they'll be uh, it's like, oh, well, I needed you the other night. You know, I you know, had a virus or, you know, or, uh, you know, can't you just write a program that fills up my car with gas? Or, if you had people say it's like random stuff to you that, you know, can't you write a program that just does something you don't write programs to do? You've never had a conversation like that? Really? You're playing too much beach volleyball. Some of you had to have those conversations. When a friend or family member just says something completely ridiculous, thinking that you can do stuff with programming. Really? Oh, that ha it happens to me like often. I got a crazy neighbor that says that stuff all the time. Like, you know, you should write a program to do that. Like what? You know, cook burgers. And he's serious. Yeah, he thinks that's what we do. That's right. I agree. Yes. I, of course. I don't know what you mean by... <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we're going to say we're limited by limited... To the problems that a human can fully articulate okay which means that we can use computers to solve a subset of all problems fair enough all right abstraction what is abstraction Okay. Simplification. If you go back to the 150 slides, abstraction was what Einstein simplified, I think, is what Dr. Lockler has on those slides. So simplifying a problem into smaller steps. Why do we need that? How does abstraction and algorithms work hand in hand to help us overcome this statement here. We're limited to the problems that a human being can fully articulate. Maybe we can, if you break it down into smaller steps, you are able to do one short task at a time, which is to the algorithm because that's what algorithms do. They do one small thing at a time. Okay. So that they can, so the computer knows exactly what it needs to do and when. So taking this statement right here, this last one, that we're limited to the types of problems we can solve. So um, um, so take all of you and your, uh, your, your past experience in computer science. Um, let's go back to like our first programming class that we ever had. Would you agree that the problems you can solve today are more complex than the problems you were capable of solving with with a program uh, the day the first day you started programming? Why? Ah, you've gotten better at that, right? I mean, is the difficulty with computer programming learning the language? I mean, that's just one extra hoop you have to jump through, right? You know, if uh, to learn a foreign language, for example, you know, uh, when we talk about our natural languages, we already know how to deal with people. So we could already sit there and communicate with people and tell jokes and stuff like that. So if you're dealing with somebody who speaks a different language than you, you're going to agree upon a language. Maybe you decide to make it fair and then both of you learn a new language. Um, probably not, but <laughs> you might decide to do something like that. The point is that you already know how to problem solve for people. So you just have to learn the syntax, of that new language. And generally, 
as long as you take it seriously, it's not that difficult to learn a brand new language. Most people, if you throw them into a, uh, um, you know, if you, if you dropped me off in Italy, okay, just with my own devices, and I'm living there for a year, I would just naturally pick up some Italian. Okay, uh, I would have to probably go out of my way to find people who were willing to talk to me in Italian and not English, because most of the world today speaks English, so they'll just like, oh, dumb American, let's speak English to him. <laughs> but you would just naturally pick it up by talking it, by, by having to deal with people saying stuff to you, and over time you'd, you'd figure it out, because you're not having to learn the problem-solving side of it. Now, with computer programming, when I say you have to learn how to solve problems uh, for a computer, really you're getting better at generating algorithms, generating a, a detailed set of instructions to give to a computer. And part of getting better at that is being able to conceive of larger problems. And to conceive of larger problems, you typically need to get better at breaking larger problems down into smaller pieces so that you can write an algorithm to solve this piece, then write another algorithm to solve this piece, and so on and so forth. So that's a skill that we've gotten better at over the years. As we became more experienced computer programmers, we got better at not being intimidated by a scary sounding problem. We got better at breaking it down into smaller pieces. And as you become more and more experienced, you become more able to tackle um, larger problems without having to break them down to as small of pieces. That makes sense? So, Abstraction goes hand in hand with algorithms. We must simplify in order to create more complex algorithms. Initially, we're simplifying um, even simple algorithms until we start becoming practiced at articulating our solutions in an algorithm. That's a detailed set of instructions. All right, so abstraction is an important concept that goes hand in hand. All right, automation. Tell me, tell me about this. What is automation? I think we all know what automation is, right? At some high level, right? What is it? Set, set it and forget it, right? We want the, I mean, one of the reasons we like computers is they can do things, they can do mundane tasks that would eventually become boring or error prone for human beings. So we're using these computers as tools. You know, rarely, you know, we have a whole area of computer science like an artificial intelligence where we're, we're dabbling with trying to make a computer seem more human-like, right? Um, and that's actually a very weak area of uh, computer science. You know, we, um, there's an argument, of can we, is perfecting AI even a thing? You know, is that possible? We have movies about it, but, you know, can we ever really reach that? The reality is, is that we don't really, what's the, what's the reason to have a computer that can mimic a human? Well, I, mean, I, I guess I asked the wrong question. What's the point of having a computer that a human being would confuse with a human? You know, like when you, when you call one of these uh, call centers and they have like one of these robots that talks to you, you pretty much know you're talking to a robot, right? Um, they're not convincing you otherwise. And usually they're frustrating, right? They want you to say the, the, the phrase in just the right way and... You know, then, then old Alex gets all frustrated and wants to talk to their manager. And then the person said to go back to the main menu, press zero. And then he starts screaming. Uh, I've seen this happen in a parking lot once. And um, so I guess I, it sounds like it would be cool to be able to train a computer to do human things, to act human. But I'm not sure how practical that is at the end of the day. Computers are good at what computers are good at. Well, computers are good at what human beings have programmed them to be good at. But human beings aren't really weak at being human beings. 
We want the computers to do that mundane stuff, the stuff that was error prone for us when we get too tired or we lose our concentration, that kind of stuff. Okay, so we like to automate tasks. These are a tool. Okay, these computers are tools for us and through abstraction and algorithms, we solve problems that tend towards automating tasks that we don't want to have to do ourselves or would be um, too complex or, or too uh, um, error prone to do ourselves. Okay, so uh, how do we say automation without, how do we define automation without saying automation? What phrase did you use? without intervention, something like that. Okay. Information. So, so far, this goes back to that statement about if we think of computer science like an egg and we crack it, we have all this stuff fall out. Are we starting to see the link between these things? You know, they, they, don't, they don't exist independent of each other. They're all part of the grand ideas of computer science. They're all part of what computer science is. All right, so when we say information, information is part of what computer science is. What are we talking about? What is the information as it relates to our computer programs, let's say? Data. Yeah, the data on which we're working. I mean, usually we're, we're operating off some level of inputs, right? It might be, you know, press one to, you know, reach this department or press two to reach some other department, something simple like that. But more often than not, I mean, so like a phone system like that, that would be a form of automation that isn't so complex, but it's replacing a human. It's replacing something that is mundane, easily replaceable. Because we could certainly put a human at a call center, right? They existed for years. You know, and a human being can pick up the phone, hello, how can I direct your call? And they say, well, I'm trying to reach so-and-so. Okay, one moment, please. And they push a couple buttons, they type in the extension and it takes you to that person. Now, that's personal. So, you know, you know, these commercials today, they make fun of the fact that we've automated some of those processes, right? But the reality is, is um, it's cost savings to replace paying a human being 10 or $15 an hour to sit there and answer the phone when we can have an automated system do it for us and probably do it more accurately. They're not going to, when you say, oh, I want to talk to so-and-so, they're not going to accidentally type in the wrong extension and connect you to uh, you know somebody else. They don't make the mistake, you know, so it, it, it's more accurate. Now, when you call up a call center or something like that, how many of you would prefer to talk to a real person versus prefer to talk to the uh, automated system? What's your preference? Go ahead. Probably a real person. Okay. Why? Okay. Do you ever request that the system isn't built for? Yeah, the, the, the systems are cookie cutter. Yeah. So uh, if you're calling to do something extremely cookie cutter, the systems work out. But if it's even a little bit off script, you might not really be able to accomplish what you want to accomplish. And rather than spending 15 minutes navigating their system, you might be better off just talking to a real person and get to the bottom of it quicker uh, or more quickly, whatever. Um, okay. Anybody rather talk to the automated system? I'd rather talk to the automated systems when the automated systems work. It's when you start getting automated system rage, where you just can't get it to, and you have to say it multiple times. Those are the ones I don't like. I'd rather push the button three than say some phrase or something like that. Don't you hate those phrase ones? Maybe you ever had to, like Apple, Apple has a phrase one. And they say, you know, 
you know, say what you're, uh, what you're calling about. And then you're ready to start saying, and then they say, for example, and they recite this entire like book of things you could say. And then you just hang up. It's like, that's, that's how they get good customer service. They never get bad reviews because they never get to the point of actually reviewing somebody. Okay, so our information is our data. How does that relate to computer science? What's the nature of data? Are human beings good at working with, or are we good at working with data? Not large amounts. Not large amounts. We're fine working with, you know, like we can go up and we can pay for a candy bar, right? And we can, uh, you know, we can work with, you know, hey, give you five bucks and they give you some change back. That's not so overwhelming that we're able to, you know, we can make change for that, right? So we're not dealing with tons and tons of data. But as soon as the data starts getting out of hand or it's a gigantic collection of data, we either become um, inaccurate or so slow that it's not it, that that we should replace ourselves. It's not efficient. You know, uh, you think about. Um, I mean, uh, how many of you? I'm guessing based on ages, probably not a ton. How many of you have ever spent a significant amount of time in an actual library? Like looking stuff up, like actually having to go and hunt down books. And I could I could only say I've done this to a certain extent. This because I I kind of grew up right in that transition period. Because even now, when you go into a library, they have some sort of computer system for you to kind of dial into where that physical book might be um, on the shelf, right? But before that, you had the, 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 the Dewey Decimal System, the card, card catalogs. Have you ever seen those in a place other than a museum? Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't efficient. It was more efficient than just randomly wandering through the library, trying to you know, look at each book. Is this the one? Is this the one? Is this the one? You know, you can sort of get to the right area, but we were slow at doing it. Now, you know, I, I, a lot of, uh, and it's really come into the research area quite a bit now. Um, we've become so dependent on the internet and Google and things like that for finding information that this whole idea of doing literature, literature searches and using libraries has kind of gone away. I mean, having a physical library now is almost like a museum. I mean, you know, you, if you've been to Washington, D.C., you kind of have to go to the Library of Congress to say you did, maybe. You know, like that's one of the places you go, but... You do your research on Google. It's where we go and find stuff. I mean, anything you can find in Library of Congress, you can find on Google. You know, Google's hooked into it. All right, so as soon as information gets too complex or too large, we would then prefer to have an automated system work with it. But we're going to have to create algorithms to teach it how to manipulate that data in the way that's beneficial to us. All right, so... Um, we're going to say data often complex or large in nature that we need computing systems to manipulate. All right, interface. Now, one thing we, we're gonna see here is that some of these things could apply to things outside of computer science. Interface would be one of them, right? Um, so when I say interface, what am I talking about? Okay, a link between two things. So, for instance, like uh, uh, in a car, a steering wheel and you know, the shifter and all that stuff, that's part of the interface for driving the car, right? Now, are those things absolutely 100% required for driving a car? They're quite helpful, right? <laughs> but not required. I mean, you, you can get it. 
Can you get uh, some sticks <laughs> connected to the wheels a little bit? I mean, with enough strength, you can start. How many have you ever driven a car that didn't have power steering? You've driven a car, okay. Uh, um, uh, what did you think? Yeah. Right. So, would you say that power steering is something that you appreciate, but not something you need? Right. So, power steering is part of our interface with that car. We've enhanced that interface, and so now when we make a turn, we can do it with one finger, um, as opposed to <laughs> really having to get your weight behind it. Um, put your feet down. Well, have you seen the Flintstones? They even have engines. That's historical research. That's part of your first bibliography. <laughs> Flintstone cars. So, are brakes necessary? Or, or do they fall in that category of quite helpful? Quite helpful. <laughs> they're, they're quite helpful. Um, so, when we talk about interfaces, um, how many of you have ever had a human computer interaction course? You don't even know, do you? Old Alex. Old Alex thought about it for a second. Like, you said you had one? Yeah. Okay. What kind of stuff do they talk about in the human computer interaction course? Um, Just generally speaking. Uh, it dealt with the different diagrams and unified modeling languages so that we could interact through a different way that we could design um, structures and we have skeletons in order to communicate so, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. so what you're talking about there is kind of how can we more consistently create interfaces mm -hmm. through a modeling language modeling. but the the flip side of it is also what interfaces make sense for people mm -hmm. right and have we have we seen those evolve over the last many many well really we Seen those evolve over all the all of history, right? You know, cars, original ones didn't have brakes, didn't have power steering, didn't have windshields, didn't have all these things. And you know, you get enough bugs in your teeth, you put a windshield on. You, <laughs> you hit enough things, you start thinking about, well, how do we slow down more quickly? You know, we enhance our interfaces to make life more easily. When we deal uh, more uh, more most easiest, or yeah, that's that's the right English, I think, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, to make a, a, a life easier. Um, now, specifically, when we deal with human-computer interaction, they talk about things like placement of buttons and, and, and stuff like that. How many, how many buttons is too many buttons? That, that kind of stuff. Um, and even when we think about that, if you uh, uh, have been a smartphone user for, uh, for a very long time, um, you've seen the nature of mobile apps change, Right? You know, in fact, Apple just made this big push this last year, and I think Google did a similar thing. Um, but Apple made a big push where they went uh, through the App Store and pruned a bunch of old apps off the App Store that kind of had interfaces that didn't really live up to modern interface design standards. Okay, I had something like 40 of my old apps yanked off the App Store for just having old interfaces. So then I choose, do I, do I go back through and update the interfaces or do I just abandon it, depending on you know, how much money they were still generating, that kind of stuff. But you know, the point is, is that what we deem to be acceptable today might not be acceptable in 10 years. And what was acceptable 10 years ago might not be acceptable today. Um, so this idea of an interface is this constant moving target. But when we think about interfaces in terms of problem solving, is the interface itself part of the problem solving? How important is the interface? Yeah, it, it really is one of the most important parts, which, which becomes a very interesting sticking point, I think, for computer scientists. Um, if you've worked in industry or worked with folks in industry, one um, issue you'll run into, I think, with, with computer science, uh, traditional people, is programmers think that the programmers are the most important. That's what programmers think, okay? Now, let's go over on the graphic design side of things. So the graphic design people think that the graphic designers are the most important. 
we don't understand the program. They're all mathy and nerdy. We don't understand that we're, we make things look good. They make things work. They're both required, right? You know, we're not going to say it's acceptable for having something that looks great that's non-functional. But we're also not going to say it's acceptable for something that works great but looks like crap or is non-functional because the interface is garbage. All right, so if I put you in front of some amazingly created car, works really well, has amazing gas mileage, whatever, whatever you deem to be good about cars, uh, and we put in a really crappy user interface, like, you know, there, there's no uh, uh, steering wheel or something like that, you're not going to deem that to be a very good car, regardless of the technology that's under the hood in the car, because the interface is lousy. Make sense? So to say that the interface is one of the most important parts, I think, is fair. Now, somewhere in the middle there, though, there, there, there's some balancing point, isn't it? You know, we started off today uh, bashing Apple. You know, and so let's kind of circle back on that a little bit so we can keep it in the technology realm here. Um, Apple certainly puts interface ahead of what's under the hood. I mean... The, that's a big problem people typically have with Apple. I mean, I think this laptop, which is their, their new MacBook Pro, is like kind of the perfect example of this. The guts inside this laptop could be found in a machine for half the price. And I'm being generous when I say half the price. Really less than half the price. You know, uh, so this was like a $4,800 laptop. You could probably get pretty equivalent power, let's say for... Certainly under 2000 I would say. So why is this 4800 bucks? Well, I mean, the thing is cut out of a single piece of aluminum, and it's Apple aluminum, not normal aluminum. So you could use this to, to kill somebody, probably, and I mean, it, maybe it would bend, but not very much. You know, these plastic laptops, they're just going to fall apart. Well, we don't, we don't use laptops to do that. So this is not your typical weapon of choice. So kind of who cares, right? Um, it almost seems to me that, that Apple focuses too much on design, too much on interface, um, and kind of ignores that technology push on the other side. Now, having said that, sometimes you run into something that just makes sense, and what makes sense about it is the interface. Like, oh, well, that's not really a, a very, a, so uh, the iPod would probably be a good example, right? Um, so the idea of carrying music with you came before the iPod. What did Apple do? Apple said, well, now you can carry more songs with you. So can we actually put a hard drive in something that will fit in your pocket so you can actually have more songs? And can we give you a convenient interface so that you can get to your music in a reasonable way? That's the problem that Apple solved. So they did that. I mean, the iPod was really mostly an interface solution, not a technology solution. MP3s already existed. In fact, if anything, Apple introduced the AAC format, which was proprietary and made things worse <laughs> from, from that perspective. Um, you know, but uh, uh, interfaces are, are an integral part of any solution, but they're not the only part. They have to be married to the actual... Uh, abstraction and algorithm in order to accomplish stuff. But when you specifically deal with human-computer interaction, they're talking about how do human beings interface with computers. Um, so kind of an interesting um, uh, area that you might choose to do when we, when we get to the research, uh, the research area for interface is look at touchscreen laptops. Uh, how many of you have a touchscreen laptop? I know none of the Mac people do because at least Steve Jobs said it never made sense. Who, who, who knows what? Um, now, do you use your touchscreen very often? No. Okay. Um, would you say it's helpful or gimmicky? What do you mean by gimmicky? Um, just like an added feature just to say it's added. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, kind of. I'd rather have my hands on the keyboard. Yeah, I mean, it's more efficient to get stuff done that way. Um, and I feel similar, you know, so, so Apple's made a little transition towards that. You know, the big thing with these new MacBook Pros is that the, what they call it, the magic bar or something. So at the top of the keyboard, they've taken away those function buttons and instead they put a, uh, another screen there. 
I have found it useful for the escape button, but since there's no haptic feedback, uh, you're not sure you hit it. <laughs> but uh, it feels gimmicky to me. Now, who knows, maybe with people being able to write software specifically for that, they'll come up with some interesting stuff to do with that. And same thing, every now and then you might find something on the touch screen, like, oh, that's helpful. That's, you know, that makes sense. But it's one of those things that it's more of the exception than the rule. When you're sitting at a laptop, you have a keyboard, you have a screen, the way we interface with that is with a mouse and a keyboard. That's how computers currently work. And until we change that genre, you know, it makes sense to touch this screen. You got it in your hand, it, I mean, that, it just makes sense. When you get to a larger device like this, it stops making sense. And these are all things in interface research. So you have all sorts of areas of human computer inter interaction that deals with touch screens versus not touch screens and why and, and, and things like that. Um, so we're gonna say, I like the word she used. So she said the interface is a link between the user and the software. Now, does every solution that we create have an interface of some sort? Yeah. Some interfaces might not be interactive interfaces, right? So only some programs might have an interactive interface. But all programs have an interface at some level, even if it's something that a human being either doesn't directly interact with, um, but there is, at the very least, you can go in, you know, if you double click on an icon in Windows, you can go into Task Manager and kill it off. Well, you had an interface into that program through that. It was a hook into the operating system, something like that. Okay, so interfaces exist in every single solution, every single problem we solve through algorithms and abstraction and and uh, automation blah 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 so we're you know again we're connecting the dots for all these things all right, so now things pun intended get a little bit more abstract what's intelligence provided by a human it is the ability to Intelligent human knowledge that you provide to the application. Okay. Knowing, I think we're talking about how to walk. Okay. So are computers intelligent? Okay, so it's clear humans are intelligent, right? So we're the intelligent ones. And any intelligence that a computer seems to have, we probably put it there, right? That's our, our algorithms, our abstractions, whatever. We, we made it seem intelligent, but that intelligence had a source. Okay, and that source was us. Okay, so how does intelligence play into, so this is again, the computer science is an egg, we crack it all these grand ideas come out. How does intelligence play into every computer program, if we just want to use this generic term, but um, you know, how does it play into every problem we solve using a computer? Do computers solve problems on their own? Or are humans always involved? Yeah, we're involved. Yeah, we, we, we start the ball rolling, okay? We get this tool putting in, you know, we, we come home from Home Depot with a hammer. The, the hammer's not going to hammer the nail in itself. Even the power hammers, right? You got to still pick it up and line it up. You got to 
there's an amount of work that needs to get done and the human being is involved. Um, so the intelligence begins and ends with that human. And all computer programs, all solutions to problems that exist inside of uh, uh, computers have intelligence because we put them there. All right. So we're going to say human provided I know the best way to say it. Here we'll say human provided ingredient that makes all programs tick. I think that's a reasonable enough uh, solution. Okay, but a, a very important piece there for us, which then also starts getting into some interesting things with artificial intelligence. Um, because artificial intelligence would indicate that a computer potentially, if we start going down that line of saying we can, that it's possible to per perfect artificial intelligence, a la the matrix and, and, and that stuff, um, that computers could then be intelligent on their own. They could evolve to the point where a human being is no longer necessary. What do you think? Is that possible? I mean, I, I think we're all relatively good with, at the very least, the human beings had to get the ball rolling, right? We had to use our intelligence to start the process. So, you know, my, um, uh, I guess, abstract question is, is it possible for one day a human being to create a program that is self-evolving that could potentially exhibit intelligence on its own without human intervention? Then you get down to this idea of what's the nature of intelligence. What does it mean for something to be intelligent? And is it real or is it fake intelligence? Does it just seem intelligent, but it's not really intelligence? So you think, yeah. Tell, tell me tell me why. Um, well, you saw the matrix. It went down. No, I, well, I mean, if you, if you just think about it, if someone does create a program that does take in what's going on around it, I feel like it's going to be able to, over time, create or be able to use past situations to make decisions for the future. Is that intelligence, though? Yeah. Is it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, intelligence, I would say, would be using your past knowledge in, in your current situation. Because your knowledge is what, what you know, so intelligence would have to play or, or would have to look back on that so that, I mean, there are people that are intelligent, I mean, that don't necessarily, I guess, have common sense, they're book smart, but, so they know a lot, which a computer can know a lot, that's just storing everything, but what happens is, are they able to, in certain, in a, depending on the situation, be intelligent, know what data to pull when a certain situation and I think that'll come from when it constantly uses past situations. Okay. So if it learns from its past situations. So does that mean that some people are not intelligent? Yeah. I, I think that... Um, do you mean that or do you mean that some people appear to be more intelligent than others? Yes. So do... Would you say that all people are intelligent to some at some yes. level? Yeah. Okay. So I guess what I'm what I'm kind of hunting for here is at what point what what is the minimum requirement to say that right there is intelligence? Go ahead. We still don't know. Really. Yeah. We can come up for, with things that intelligence will exhibit, but we we can't we don't know yet. We haven't Okay. So we, we, we've seen the results. We can look at something and say, yeah, that was created through intelligence. But we can't go back and say, this is that intelligence. This, this is what made that intelligent. We, we have trouble articulating what is intelligence, although we can see evidence of, of intelligence. We feel confident that that's evidence of intelligence. But we have problems articulating this side of it. 
Okay, so this almost comes back to this idea of like, well, we can walk because we can walk. Um, there's aspects of that we just don't we just don't get. Um, so then, you're saying I, I'm speculating that if I ask, can a computer ever become intelligent? Then your answer would probably be maybe, because we don't we don't know. Can become intelligent at specific tasks. Okay. So you would believe that a computer can't attain human level intelligence. No. Okay. We still have absolutely no clue how there's supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. And we have absolutely no clue how we would even start unsupervised learning. Just give information and turn it into something. At the same time, just because let's say we had a computer that was extremely uh, had a lot of data could fall back to a lot of past circumstances, take a lot of things into consideration before it makes a, uh, you know, has a response. Just because a computer seems intelligent doesn't mean that it is. You know, intelligence could be faked, let's say. I'm, this is all hypothetical, right? Intelligence could be faked through high speed and a lot of data. I'm oversimplifying, I'm sure, but that seems to be plausible, at least, right? So... Is this word intelligence here, and in, um, as it relates to the, the grand ideas of computer science, kind of a, this, it's like this vague kind of animal. We feel it exists, but it's really hard to kind of articulate what that is. Well, wouldn't you say that human intelligence is using a lot of data or past circumstances to make decisions? Probably, or at the very least, we might suspect that, but... but I don't know that we know. Like, I think, for me, I would say, I think I'm pretty intelligent. But why? What makes me intelligent? I don't know. I, I come up with a lot of right answers. Does that make me intelligent? Well, there's computer programs that come up with a lot of right answers. I come up with a lot of wrong answers, too. Computer programs typically don't. So... It's hard to articulate that, although I believe that I'm pretty intelligent. Although I don't know what that means. So it's, it, it's, a, it's really a vague thing. And, and I think for us, especially being at a Christian university, the, connect, the, the connection here is this idea of human. Okay? We're really talking about human intelligence here. What we're, it's our, um, you know, it, it's it's our special ingredient that, that we're throwing into uh, the, the, the problem-solving experience with a computer that can't be there unless we're involved. Now, that leaves room for us to say that we could have a computer eventually that might fake that very, very well. But it's still not human intelligence. I could be wrong. Okay, you know, we, we might be able to dis, you know, distinguish at a better level later on what intelligence might actually be. But it's my personal belief that uh, intelligence is a very human trait. Um, and, you know, I, it's, I think it's just tough to even take it much beyond that. It's, it's, it's just a, a tough thing. So, you know, intelligence as it relates to the grand ideas of computer science, at least in a traditional sense, is really the, the, the idea that to make computers work, a human must be involved. It's really that piece. Um, all right. Ooh, cognition, I like that one. What's cognition? At a glance, it seems like, well, that's kind of in that same ballparky as intelligence, right? It's another one of those things that's going to be a little bit hard to articulate what that guy is. Maybe I want to take a stab at cognition. No. <laughs> Shiva. I'm like, I didn't see that 
else. No, he's he's walking in right now. You can come in. We're still on recording, but you can come in. Right. You're on break. Uh, we're we'll probably take no. We'll probably take a break, and it depends how long it takes you guys to come up with cognition. All right, fine. You want you want to take like a ten minute break at the same time as they are. Let's take a ten minute break, and we'll come back. Better have an answer for cognition when we come back. <laughs>